Welcome to our live webcast, Sustainable Design and Embodied Carbon, What Structural Engineers Need to Know. Thank you for joining us. We are joined today by our speakers, Kelly Roberts and CSEA Sustainable Design Committee Chair and Megan Stringer, SEI Sustainability Committee Co-Chair. At this time, I will turn the floor over to Kelly to begin the presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kelly Roberts. I'm a principal at Walter P. Moore um, in Atlanta. And with me today is Megan Stringer, an associate principal with Home Structures in San Francisco. And we'll be speaking to you today about sustainable design and embodied carbon and what structural engineers need to know. First, I wanted to let you all know that NCSEA has created a new sustainable design committee that I currently chair whose mission is to promote sustainable design practices within the profession of structural engineering through leadership, advocacy, outreach, and education. As with any committee with NC NCSEA, the main goal is to support practicing structural engineers. This committee does that in several ways by advocating for the inclusion of sustainable design within the practice of structural engineering and the role of the structural engineer in sustainability. It's becoming clear that structural engineers need a seat at the table um, and will need that seat even more so in the future. Another objective is to support the formation of sustainable design committees on the local SEA level and regularly correspond with local SEA committees to share and disseminate educational materials, white papers, presentations, all those good things created at the local level to all SEA member organizations, as well as materials produced um, by complementary organizations such as SEI. Um, this committee will not be involved in producing a lot of technical information. SEI Sustainability Committee is, is already very effective at that task. Um, they have been for quite some time, um, but this is rather to serve as a conduit for structural engineers and engineering groups to learn about what others are doing and to share that information with others. A big part of the role of the committee is to partner and communicate with the goings on with SEI Sustainability Committee. That's why Megan and I are both speaking to you today. Um, and most notably the SE 2050 commitment, which we'll discuss later on in this presentation. Uh, finally, the committee will advocate for structural engineering community with respect to policy. There are several states, counties, cities, um, et cetera, that have adopted low carbon uh, construction codes. And these codes affect the materials that we specify. And so we need to be involved um, in those codes, the creation of those codes and have a voice um, in those policies. Eventually, we'd like to have a representative on the committee from every member organization, every SEA, uh, to serve as a liaison between, the N between NCSEA and the local MOs and also to, for those MOs to establish their own local sustainable design committees. This is happening in a couple SEAs, but it's, it's definitely not reached everywhere. This is the general structure and how we interact with both SEI and SC 2050. And we're looking for people um, that are interested in joining the national committee and also interested in creating their own um, sustainable design committees. And I'll share my contact information um, at the end of the presentation and please email me if you're interested in joining our committee or starting a, a local sustainable design committee within your member organization. All right, so we'll dive right into an introduction to embodied carbon. Um, of course, embodied carbon is just one piece of the carbon puzzle and it's associated with building construction and use. Embodied carbon has to do with the materials and products used to construct the, the building. Um, it's all of the carbon dioxide emitted by extracting, manufacturing, transporting, and installing materials. And it's not a small amount of carbon. Every year, 66 billion square feet of buildings are constructed, and the embodied carbon emissions of that construction is approximately 3.8 billion metric tons of CO2 per year. In fact, we're building so much that we're actually building a new New York City every month for the next 30 years. Between now and 2050, we're gonna add 2 billion people to the planet and close to double the square footage of the built environment. And of course, we know that if we carry on with business as usual, the IPCC predicts that we will well overshoot the goal of staying below two degrees Celsius. So looking at this a different way, 
Um, but these graphs are from Architecture 2030. We know that buildings alone account for 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. 28% is from operational, which is largely where the focus has been. And rightly so, it's a bigger piece of the pie, but as we've driven down operational emissions through smarter designs, there has been a shift to focus on the 11% from embodied carbon. And the critical thing about embodied carbon is that it happens day one when the building opens and it never gets reduced. No future efficiency or PV panels are, are gonna drive it down. And then the next 30 years, the critical time period, according to the IPCC, embodied carbon will account for over half of new construction carbon. So as we approach 2050 and try to decarbonize the building industry, we can't get there without focusing on this piece of the pie. So the breakdown of embodied carbon can vary from project to project based on size and materials, et cetera. But we do know a couple things. Um, we know that most of the emissions are from structure, most are from steel and concrete, and most of the impact from concrete is from cement. And of course, cement is not the same as concrete. Cement is part of it. Um, it makes up only 12% of the weight of concrete, but is responsible for 95% of the CO2. It's the second most consumed resource in the world with more than 4 billion tons produced globally every year and accounts for somewhere between five and 8% of total global CO2 emissions. So it's a big impact. Um, in general, the structural materials have a big impact on embodied carbon. And this is essentially why it's critical that structural engineers lead this conversation. The materials we specify make up a big piece of this pie and we need to be involved in reducing their impact. Um, and you'll find from what's happening in the industry that if we don't pick up this ball and run with it, somebody else will. Either the architects you're working with or the sustainability consultants on your job will be trying to tackle embodied carbon. And the truth is, is that no one knows structural materials better than structural engineers. We are going to know how best to reduce quantities, how to optimize cement, how to best source and specify materials, and what's appropriate and what's not. So we have to lead this conversation. So let's take a quick look at what's happening in, in our industry and why this has come to the forefront. There's been a groundswell of discussion and advocacy around embodied carbon in the last couple of years. In 2019, the World Green Building Council released the Embodied Carbon Call to Action Report. And this was the first call to action that really started to name all the stakeholders involved in embodied carbon and task them with what they can and they should do about embodied carbon with deadlines. AIA has also addressed embodied carbon. In 2019, AIA issued a climate emergency and added language to its code of ethics surrounding sustainability and the use of healthy environmentally friendly materials. AAA Committee on the Environment added whole building life cycle analysis as a best practice to their toolkit for projects seeking a top 10 status. And just this year, AAA 2030 added embodied carbon as one of the metrics that can be reported for, product, for projects in DDX. Building Green um, issued a great spotlight report on the urgency of embodied carbon and what you can do about it. This is a couple years old now, but it's still a really great resource. If you haven't read this report, I strongly recommend um, that you do because it's, it's a wonderful guide. And of course, um, Architecture 2030 has been leading the way on embodied carbon, issuing a 2030 challenge for embodied carbon um, to be carbon neutral by 2050. And they've coupled that with their carbon smart materials palette. You may have heard some of your clients talking about this, um, but it's supposed to be a resource for architects to choose better material alternatives. If you're just diving into embodied carbon and don't know where to start, this is a great resource, um, but it is just the beginning. Another organization that's a true leader in this space is Carbon Leadership Forum. Um, they're a group that's solely focused on embodied carbon and have been doing some incredible work in this space. If you're interested in learning more, I really encourage you to check them out on the web. There's a wealth of information on CLF's website. Um, there are also local hubs in cities across the United States. We have one in Atlanta. Um, and you can find out if there is one by going to uh, their website and seeing if there's a hub in your city. 
So in response to the growing importance of embodied carbon and to complement organizations such as AIA 2030, an initiative called SE 2050 was created within the Carbon Leadership Forum and then adopted by SE, SEI. Um, SE 2050 is a challenge for structural engineers to push for carbon neutrality by 2050. And you'll hear a good bit about this later from Megan. Um, but SE 2050 is essentially our opportunity as structural engineers to own our carbon and do something about it. So it's clearly becoming a big deal, um, but I'm sure you're wondering what we can actually do about it. Um, so the first thing that we do is understand our impact. We do this through a process called life cycle assessment, which is an evaluation of the environmental effects associated with any given activity from the initial gathering of the material from the earth until the point at which all residuals are returned to the earth. It's an ISO governed process where we look at all the phases in the life of a material from the harvesting of the material through manufacturing construction to demolition and disposal. And then we look at multiple environmental impact categories, including greenhouse gases or global warming potential, um, embodied carbon, those terms are generally used somewhat interchangeably. Um, and then other environmental impacts as well, such as eutrophication, smog formation, ozone and acidification. LCA is an essential component to getting to a whole building LCA. The process starts with the PCR or the product category rules. These are guidelines that establish the rules for performing a product LCA. The result of a product LCA is an EPD, an environmental product declaration. A whole building LCA is essentially an entire system of products, each with their own impacts all tallied up to comprise an entire building. This is an example of an EPD for a specific product. It reads like a nutrition label for the environmental impacts of a product, in this case for a concrete mix. So let's look at how we actually do that. Our goal for a whole building LCA is to start with a baseline building and then improve upon it. And unfortunately, the world of LCA isn't as cut and dry as operational energy where you have um, ASHRAE 90.1. Um, but there is a guide that was written by SEI Sustainability Committee that defines some guidelines for establishing the baseline for this. It essentially talks about things like not using just a straight cement mix for your concrete mixes. You need to use industry averages, regional industry averages to, as a baseline. Um, so it provides a guide of how to establish a baseline and the, kind of the rules surrounding that. The guide built upon previous work by Athena and ASTM, uh, Kate Simonen and the Carbon Leadership Forum, as well as past SEI Sustainability Committee publications. Um, for concrete, for example, this guide says that you need to use the NRMCA Regional Industry Average EPDs, as I mentioned, for, um, for concrete. Um, which are not straight cement mixes. Um, in order to achieve reductions, you're going to have to be surgical and focus on every element individually and focus on putting the carbon where, where you actually need it. So we'll talk about this a little bit more later. So we first establish our baseline structure for the whole building LCA. We look at the entire structure and all of the enclosure. Um, and then different LCAs can, can take into account different kind of boundaries. Um, but the typical LCA, um, for example, the one that is in lead, it includes the structure and enclosure. In, actual, in order to actually uh, perform the LCA um, or an embodied carbon analysis, you have to start with quantities. If you're regularly tracking your materials, um, then it's a bit easier and definitely Revit made this much easier. So if you start with a bill of materials um, that you likely got from a BIM model, and then you input that into a commercial software. Um, and there are a number of them. I've listed some out here, such as Tally, um, One Click LCA, and Athena. Um, then the environmental impact factors are baked into the software and they're curated in such a way that they can be used together. And from that, you get comparative output that you can use to determine where your greatest impacts or your hot spots are. And then from there, you can take a number of steps to reduce your impact. 
And what's great is that you can actually achieve lead points now for attempting an LCA on your projects, and then you can get even more for actually showing that you've reduced your impact. And there's also a pilot credit in lead available for um, now for using a new tool called EC3. It's the Embodied Carbon in Construction Calculator. It's not an LCA tool. It doesn't cover all of the life cycle stages. Um, and it only focuses on embodied carbon, but it's a very user-friendly tool that takes material quantities and EPDs and can help teams find better material alternatives. Um, I use this tool quite a bit to compare concrete mixes in my, in my area. There's um, a lot of concrete mixes that are in there um, in Atlanta. And you can basically go through you know, and specify that you want a 5,000 mix. Um, and then you can look at all the ones available from different suppliers that have EPDs and you can basically look at their environmental impacts. As structural engineers, uh, there's a lot of strategies that we can take to reduce carbon on our projects. And you'll have to find the right strategies um, for your projects and your clients. Uh, but what's important is that you take control of your destiny in lieu of leaving it in the hands of others. If structural engineers don't lead the embodied con carbon conversation than others may, and you may find yourself being asked by a sustainability consultant to reduce the cement in your PT slabs by 40% to satisfy the requirements for the project, which I don't think is the position any of us really wanna be in. Um, since we're the ones who specify the most impactful materials, we have to be the ones that lead the conversations. Of course, um, looking at low carbon material strategies, um, Starting with reusing existing buildings and materials is the first obvious step. Uh, the next step is material reduction. So focusing on efficiency, using structure as finish, using recycled materials. Um, your biggest emitter basically in any building, whether it be concrete, wood, or steel, is probably going to be the cement. Um, so whether it's from the frame, the slab on metal deck, the foundations, the slab on grade, focusing on cement reduction and mix optimization will always be a winning way to reduce carbon. Looking at the uh, reductions within each material, um, I mentioned reducing cement and that can be done by mix optimization, making sure you're putting the cement where you need it. So considering longer cure times for foundations or columns uh, for, for tall buildings, uh, maybe 56 or 90 day strength, 90 day strengths would uh, work just fine for those elements. And that would be a good thing to consider for your building. Um, writing performance-based specs that allow producers to um, meet your needs while optimizing cement usage. Um, when I'm performing an LCA for a project, one of the things I spe specify are the environmental impacts and I put them right there in the drawings. So I'll specify strength, age of design strength, um, air, water cement ratio, if that's a parameter that I really need to specify, and then my environmental impact thresholds, or sometimes max cement you can use as a proxy if you think that EPDs aren't gonna be regularly available um, by uh, the majority of the producers. Um, so th those are some steps that you can take in concrete. Um, for steel, uh, we're focused on first efficiency, and then really how clean the steel is. Um, EAF steel is cleaner than BOF. So try to limit um, some of the jumbo shapes that may be coming in from overseas. Um, typically overseas steel is dirtier than American. Um, metal deck can be pretty carbon intensive as well. Um, there's a lot of things to consider um, in steel, really looking at recycled content. Recycled content for different shapes can vary. Typically tubes have a lower recycled content than wide flange shapes, for example. Um, and then of course, never forgetting about what you can do for the concrete that is in a steel building. Um, and with wood, um, it isn't as much of an environmental slam dunk as you think. There's a lot of considerations that have to be taken into account for wood. Um, supply chain, um, sustainability of the forest, um, FSC, those, those things really matter with wood. Um, different wood products can cause different spikes and different environmental impacts. Um, the glue and glue lamps, for example, can cause spikes in acidification. Um, but typically, the less manufactured a product is, um, the better. Uh, it's kind of the same as um, the food that you eat. 
um, looking for less manufacturing um, usually leads to lower embodied carbon. Um, so I hope this gives you a general idea. I know that this is um, a lot of just cherry picking of different ideas here. Um, and there's a, there's a lot more to it um, when considering how to lower embodied carbon, but hopefully you can take just a couple of these snippets um, and maybe apply them um, to some of your projects. Um, and with that, I am gonna turn it over to Megan to talk about uh, SC2050, uh, the commitment to getting to net zero. All right, I think we should be good to go. Yes, yeah, so very excited to talk to you guys today about the Structural Engineering 2050 Commitment Program, or SE2050 for short. Uh, we'll, or I'll give an overview of SE2050, kind of what's different from SE2050 Challenge and SE2050 Commitment Program. We'll then go over kind of what would be required from your firm uh, when you commit to the program. We'll also talk about the SE2050 database that's forthcoming. Uh, resources that are available, and then we'll kind of end with next steps for what you can do. So jumping into the overview, a bit of history on where this whole thing came about, and Kelly kind of alluded to it, but um, given that embodied carbon had been increasingly on the minds of the design community over the last couple of years in particular, the Carbon Leadership Forum, a group out of the University of Washington, really wanted to do something about it. And so they incubated this idea about getting to net zero embodied carbon by 2050. And what came out of their efforts uh, was them issuing a challenge to the SD 2050 profession uh, last summer that was calling for all structural engineers shall understand, reduce, and ultimately eliminate embodied carbon in their projects by 2050. So in the interim of them uh, creating this challenge, they approached the SEI, uh, Structural Engineering Institute's Sustainability Committee, with this idea of developing the US's commitment program for structural engineers. And it was in December of 2019 that the SEI uh, Board of Governors voted their unanimous support of the SE 2050 challenge, and it's been within the SEI Sustainability Committee that we've been developing this program. So this uh, program did officially launch uh, six months ago as of yesterday, so we're very ecstatic with that and, and just the progress we've made in the last year and a half or two. Um, to date, we have over, um, well, we have 40 firms committed um, to this program, which is extremely ecstatic. I think it's obviously exceeded our expectations. You know, at the beginning of the year, we had set out for 50 firms by the end of this year, and we're, we're very much on track to meet and well exceed that. We've had uh, at least 580 people sign up on our website for email updates. Um, so really just excited. Uh, about um, this program. Uh, a little bit about the signatory firms, these 40 firms that we have, if you guys are curious. Uh, we have, uh, if you look at the bar chart on the left, just kind of gives you an idea of firm sizes of, of, of the firms that have committed. And the map on the right is just showing kind of map of, of our committed firms. Now note that a lot of our firms are have multiple offices, but what we were plotting kind of in this map is where uh, the firm's embodied carbon quote unquote champion is located. So really seeing a, a decent reach across the North America and would love to expand that to all, all of it. Um, so definitely uh, keep this in mind. So a bit more about our effort. So it has been greatly paralleled off of the AIA 2030 commitment and the AIA have been a very huge help in guiding us through this whole process. And this chart is really just showing uh, how we see getting to net zero uh, compared to how the architects are getting to net zero and uh, operational carbon by 2030. Now note this chart is just showing one uh, scenario of how we could possibly get to net zero uh, by 2050. And so you may be wondering, like, how is that actually possible? Uh, so, and the SEI uh, Sustainability Committee uh, published a paper back in March uh, that, that actually ponders that exact question. And so in this paper, we, uh, 
explore kind of four different ways that we see this happening and, and it's going to be uh, within a variety of combinations that this could occur but essentially it's either it's through you know the design improvements that are implemented by us and, and architects greening of the electrical grid improving material production and lastly if needed um, carbon offsets and so this paper is available for free download on the SEI sustainability committee website or on the SE 2050 website as well. So there are three parts to complying with the SE 2050 program, um, and those are plan, implement, and share. So by plan, we will have individuals and firms committing to establishing an embodied carbon action plan, which we refer to as ECAP for short. It's in this ECAP where the firms will articulate how they're gonna educate their firm staff about embodied carbon, how they're gonna report the embodied carbon of their projects, how they're gonna document their reduction strategies and how they're gonna advocate within the industry. For implement, uh, it's where firms will engage in sustainable goals on projects, specify low carbon impact materials and assess and understand the embodied carbon impact of project design decisions using LCA methods. And then finally with SHARE, this is where firms will share embodied carbon data of their projects to a central database uh, for greater understanding of national trends and developing appropriate uh, reduction targets. So you may be wondering, what are these actual requirements if your firm were to commit to the program? Uh, it's pretty simple. There's only three. Uh, and this is kind of set on purpose uh, so that uh, it can be uh, offered or it will be of wide uh, acceptance for, for many firms across the country. So those requirements uh, include, first up, uh, to commit to the official program, you will need to submit a letter uh, from your firm leadership saying that you're gonna commit to the program and meet all of the, the requirements. Um, there are templates on the website for that. So it's very easy to fill out and get, uh, just needs a signature from your uh, firm leadership. Uh, within uh, six months of signing up and committing, you will need to submit an embodied carbon action plan or that ECAP that we talked about. And there is a, a lot of resources online for what that should entail. There's also a Google form um, now that I believe has been added to the website where it just prompts you with uh, the questions for the ECAP. Um, so just really trying to make it easy and accessible for everyone to commit. And then finally, within one year and annually, uh, you will be required to submit uh, building and uh, global warming potential data to the SE 2050 database. And we'll talk a bit about the database in a second. Um, and just for your benefit, uh, the number of projects per year that are required, at least as of now, is a maximum of five, I think minimum of two. I think it depends on how big your firm is. Um, so it's a relatively low bar of entry on purpose for now. I do think these requirements will evolve as the program evol evolves, but uh, we'll definitely have firm signatories um, have a say in, in the ev evolution. So a bit on the database, and Kelly kind of hinted at this in her part of the presentation, but I think um, if any of you have been looking at uh, anything related to LCA, you've probably always wondered, well, what is my baseline building? What am I comparing my project data to? Or how do I know if my project is you know, considered high or low from a global warming potential standpoint? Um, so that's kind of what we're really trying to get at with this database um, is kind of creating these embodied carbon benchmarks. Um, so once we receive enough building data from uh, signatory firms, uh, we will be able to create these benchmarks and make them available for the industry and then also start to set reduction targets. So when we've been going about developing this uh, SE2050 beta database, uh, which should hopefully launch in next month, um, we kind of looked at these three priorities to kind of drive us in that database development. Uh, so that's, you know, familiarize structural firms with embodied carbon reporting, collect GWP results at a minimum. There's definitely, definitely talk about expanding that in the future to also include structural material quantities, but for now it's just GWP. And then increase the visibility of need for embodied carbon benchmarks. So we did uh, look at uh, the three main, I guess, main database precedents out there that, that look at embodied carbon. So first of which is DECO or the Database of Embodied quali Quantity Outputs. Um, the CLF also recently, or back in 2017, performed a benchmark study that talks about um, 
LCA benchmarks for uh, embodied carbon of structures, and then also the RICS database or the Royal Institution of Chartered Surveyors um, in the UK. So what actual data are we going to be asking of firms? Um, this is kind of the list right here. It might look rather large, but it's, it's definitely not. So really just trying to collect a certain amount of just structural system description, descriptions, uh, a little bit about your project, and uh, then the LCA, the GWP data. Um, and again, we're keeping it open to what kind of LCA tools you can use and really just looking for that GWP number. So kind of a workflow of how we see that happening. Your firms will be entering in the GWP into the database. And then from that, we'll be able to start creating carbon intensities, benchmarks, and targets. So as I mentioned, for the future, we are really interested in collecting structural material quantities at some point. Um, really start to focus on reducing that data variability that we're getting from firms, um, of which uh, we will be also uh, in the next couple of months, releasing a, a new resource that's going to give some guidance out there for structural engineers on how to kind of help uh, make uh, assumptions that we'll be making across the board. For example, like how much do you account for lap splices in your rebar, for example. We'll, so the guidance will be out on that from the committee. And then again, lastly, wanting to really establish those industry benchmarks and targets and eventually start setting reduction, um, reduction requirements in embodied carbon. So that workflow is really looking something like this, um, just in a pictorial fashion. And again, this beta version is coming uh, hopefully next month. So we're really excited about that. So you may be all, all thinking, you know, this is all great, uh, but it's all new. Where do we start? And the committee is definitely well aware of that. Uh, we realize that we are asking a lot of the profession with joining this movement, uh, but in parallel, we, uh, the committee, will definitely be providing resources and the support needed for the profession to answer this uh, challenge. And so on the SE2050 website, uh, these are some of the resources uh, that are out there. Uh, I think Kelly mentioned the kind of three publications on the right that are recent publications by the committee, um, and then the the image on the left is just a snapshot from our website. But essentially, the resources that we have, we've organized into, into five buckets, uh, whether that's embodied carbon, materials, strategies, tools, and data, or case studies. Uh, note, we are constantly updating these resources and adding new ones, and we have some really exciting ones coming uh, online, hopefully very soon. And just highlighting these two quick uh, ones on the right uh, are the embodied carbon intensity di diagrams or ESIDs. Uh, right now we only have three up online, but we're working on developing more. But essentially this is looking at like a, a typical Bay of framing uh, and trying to give you guys uh, just a, an idea of the rough embodied carbon intensity in those typical framing systems so that it's just, you know, bit of a number to have in the back of your mind when you're thinking about different systems and what impacts that they have. Um, so to create those, you know, we've had multiple engineers design it as well as running multiple LCAs on them. So we're giving you a range of impacts. And it's interesting if you look into that data, uh, just the variability in um, how we design things and how different engineering firms design things with different assumptions and um, conservatism built in. Uh, so definitely check those out. They're, they're really interesting to review. Uh, and then the ECOM tool uh, is something that we developed uh, as a basically a, a very simple, free and easy to use LCA tool that looks at uh, global warming potential um, and prompts you just with uh, entering in material quantities for your building. And it gives you kind of that donut chart uh, that you can see pictured there. And you can kind of see where your impacts are coming from, which materials, you know, creating the most impact. And uh, yeah, it's a really easy tool to use and, and one that will be accepted uh, to use uh, for your, once you commit to the program, and if you want to use that to enter in your um, embodied carbon data. And so, uh, yeah, with that, kind of uh, landing on what you can do. So really, you know, have your firm uh, commit to the SE2050 program. Definitely educate yourself. There's a lot of great resources out there uh, on the web. Um, definitely start to share your project data to the database. That's going to be really key uh, for our industry. 
uh, create your embodied carbon action plan. You know, you can do this whether or not you commit to the program. Um, there is, like I said, a, a great form up there on the website that can kind of walk you through those steps and things that you should be thinking about as you're um, in your firm. Um, you can start to, yeah, employ embodied carbon reduction strategies on your project now. You know, Kelly hit uh, on a lot of great ones uh, related to concrete, uh, steel, and wood. And uh, there's lots we can do even just from our specifications and general notes. You know, advocate within the industry, consider donating to the SE2050 uh, program, uh, join, join the committee, join either the NCSEA Sustainable Design Committee uh, or the SEI Sustainability Committee. We're always looking for new members. But I think the biggest thing, and Kelly hinted at this a lot, is that um, you know the time is now for us to step up uh, as an industry. And I think, you know, if we don't take this on, others will. I'm sure some of you have been seeing this in your projects that you know you're starting to get asked about embodied carbon. What can you do on your projects? Uh, and you know providing an ad service to do an LCA, you know, all great things that are happening. And I think, you know, it's time for us to um, join, join our design partners and really take, take this on or someone else is going to start dictating to this, this to us. And I don't think that's a, a position we as a profession want to be in. So with that, um, yeah, we'd love for you to, to join the movement and sign up. And I think we have plenty of time for questions, but maybe I'll just leave it on this slide for now with Kelly and I's contact info and just a bunch of resources out there for you. So I think with that, Kelly, we are good for Q&A. Yeah, um, and we've got quite a few that have come in. So I'm going to kick some over to you real quick um, while you're sure. thinking about SC2050. Um, yeah. So this one says, if my firm includes structural engineers as well as MEP engineers and architects, would the ECAP apply to everyone or just the structural engineers? Just the structural engineers uh, for now. I know, you know, the, the MEP has other, other um, things that they're uh, sticking to or other criteria that they can account to. I don't know, Kelly, do you have, I'm sure you have more to add to that. Yeah, I, I think that the structural engineers are the ones that are, you know, committing to the ECAP. Um, there are, there are a lot of studies that are being done by different MEP firms right now on, on the embodied carbon of, um, MEP systems. I know it's a discussion topic that's actually happening in my local hub uh, of Carbon Leadership Forum in Atlanta. Um, so it's definitely being discussed um, and architects um, are definitely looking at it, but I think the SC2050 ECAP applies to structural engineers Correct. because SC2050 is all about structural engineers. Exactly. And um, I I was just say I see Luke on the on the webinar. If you had a better answer, I can read out. Just put it in the, the Q and A. <laughs> um, okay, and so along those lines, um, firms don't need to be specifically structural engineering firms. Is that right? Um, well, no. Technically, you do need to be a structural engineering firm. What we have kind of relaxed is the location of your firm. So we do have one international. Uh, well, we have well outside. Of, we have some in Canada, so North America focused. Uh, we do have one international firm that did commit, and we talked about this as a as a committee. Um, and while we're going to be focusing all of our efforts and benchmarks set on, on North American um, numbers and practices, we are allowing firms to commit, assuming that they can meet the program requirements. So we'll just leave it at that. But if they're an AE firm. Oh, oh yes. Yeah, sorry. Yes. AE firms are totally accepted. Uh, right. If you have combo services, yeah. but you have structural engineering, then you can commit. Um, but you have to have structural engineering as a service offering. Um, okay, um, so we had a, a couple questions. Um, I'll, I'll start with some answering some of this. Are clients requesting this and are clients paying additional for LCA, et cetera? Um, so yes, clients are definitely asking about this. Um, clients are hearing about, or let's say we have lots of ty different types of clients, um, all of us, right? We have owner clients and um, architectural clients, contractor clients. And I think, you know, there's some variability between those different client types about who's asking for it. 
Um, I would say um, most architects are, um, at least that I'm working with, um, are definitely clued into this conversation because they are hearing it from AIA. Um, so you, you saw what we presented about um, the different organizations, you know, that are kind of, I guess, above us um, that have been talking about this for some time and, and, and are now really focusing on it. So we're definitely hearing about this from clients. And yes, um, we are requesting ad services to perform whole building life cycle assessments. Um, there are benefits to whole building life cycle assessments to our clients, to our owner clients, as well as our architectural clients. Um, as, as I mentioned, you can get um, points in lead um, for performing a whole building life cycle assessment. And I bet if you run the numbers, it's probably cheaper than uh, putting in vehicle charging stations. So there's a good financial case to be made for performing whole building life cycle assessment on your projects um, if that's the approach that you wanna take other than just the environmental benefit of understanding your carbon and then reducing it. Um, okay, let's jump to another one. Um, Megan, this one I think maybe for you, the carbon intensity diagrams aren't comparing the same base spacings. 30 by 45 for steel, 18 by 30 for wood. Is that really a functionally equivalent, equivalent comparison? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and one that we did talk about within the committee. I think what we were trying to do by that is really use what's uh, most logical for that material type. Uh, we have done some other studies within uh, the Structural Engineers Association of California that looked at it the opposite way where we just had a prototypical building and just designed it with uh, eight different structural lateral systems. And I think that's not necessarily, well, that's just one way of looking at it. And I think the intention with the embodied carbon intensity diagrams is really to look at more what a realistic uh, bay will be for um, for the that particular material. And the intention isn't really to necessarily compare concrete, steel, and wood. I know we do that a lot. Um, it's more to look at what you can do within that material or what's the impact of that material uh, and kind of know that and compare that with uh, uh, for the different for the different systems, I guess it's kind of it's definitely kind of muddled there, but um, yeah, I guess that's the best I can answer for now. And there will be more of these getting developed for typical framing um, schemes, and there'll be some more uh, guidance on kind of that functional equivalency and comparison um, to come. So definitely check back on the website. Okay. Um... I'll answer this one. Since reusing existing structures significantly reduces embodied carbon, are there any subsidies, incentives for developers to choose this route rather than new construction? Um, so definitely in LEED, you get more points. You can get um, up to five points um, in, the, um, in that credit uh, if you are reusing ex an existing structure. And then in you know, the other rating systems out there, I, I believe it's it's a benefit as well. Um, as far as any local subsidies or tax incentives, I don't know about, I don't know about any specifically. Um, I don't know, Megan, if you do. Um, I know that there's more stuff coming online with codes. And I think I saw something recently in New York about concrete and government projects and the government giving basically preferential treatment to, to concrete suppliers that are taking into account GWP. I don't know. I, th I think we're going to start to see more incentives coming um, and yeah, more stuff in the, in the code code world. That's going to keep pushing this even further. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, things, things vary pretty significant from local jurisdictions about how they're handling things, whether or not they're requiring IGCC, whether or not they have local sustainability codes or incentives. You know, I know there's some municipalities that give tax incentives for achieving different levels, thresholds of rating systems. Um, so I believe that that does exist out there. I do not know about every location. Um, there was a question about FSC, um, but aren't there other organizations such as FSI, SFI, um, that are also sufficient. So FSC and SFI, they are different. Um, there, there are, you know, decent differences between those two rating systems. They are both, um, I think what most people would call sustainable rating systems. And I think it's important to consider where you're at too, because 
there are some places where there isn't any FSC wood available and there's a lot of SFI wood available. Um, but there are, there are big differences between those two um, sy systems. Uh, you know, specifically, I think there's a big difference between chain of custody, um, between FSC and SFI that, um, you know, I think a lot of sustainability advocates prefer the FSC method for that. Um, but I think that um, it's important to consider, you know, your project and the types of wood products that are, you're using for your project and, and where exactly you're located when weighing those two systems and which one is better. Um, as I mentioned, wood isn't really obvious. It's actually quite complicated when it comes to its environmental impact um, and actually need, needs a good bit more study. There's um, a really great series of webinars from CLF that is on wood sustainability uh, that I recommend that you check out if you wanna get deeper, deeper into that. Um, similarly, uh, there was a question about what are the material strategies for masonry? Um, definitely look at the grout mix. Grout mix is a great way to improve it. Um, in fact, um, grout mixes for masonry, I've seen like really high volume um, supplementary cementitious material replacements for that. So I think that's a great place to focus um, in masonry. Um, let's see, more questions. Oh, Luke came in and said, I agree, focused on what structural engineers can do or encouraging architects to engage their structural engineers. Um, okay, let's get into some more questions here. Um, are the whole building LCAs mostly conducted by structural firms or different members of the design team or a third party? Um, so I'll go ahead with my answer on this and then Megan, you can jump in. Um, I see everything. Um, I think it's done a lot by structural firms, um, but I have also seen it performed quite a bit by sustainability firm, sustainability consultants. Um, and then there's a lot of architects playing in this space as well. Um, so I would say that uh, there's a lot of different people doing whole building life cycle assessments right now. Yeah, I would agree with you, Kelly, and you're definitely probably way, you're probably one of the most advanced structural engineer doing LCAs on your projects um, out there. And I think um, me, myself, only just now recently getting, finally getting asked to do it and be a part of that, whereas, you know, the architect's been doing it. And, and I know for sure, I'm just, that it is wrong, you know, that it's not accurate, because how are they going to know the specifics of what concrete mix was used where? Um, I know we talk about concrete a lot, but it's just an easy topic, um, or what was substituted in, in construction. And so, again, really think uh, us as, as the profession need to be uh, part of that discussion and talk to your architects and tell them that you want to be involved and that you can take it on, at least for the structure. Um, I did have a quick follow-up question for you, Kelly, in terms of that structure versus enclosure. Um, I guess I assume if you're doing the whole, the whole building or the LCA on the structural portion, I assume someone else is doing it on the enclosure piece. And how have you seen like that combining or what, what kind of strategies or tips do you have for that? Anything? Actually, we do it on the enclosure as oh, you do? well. Okay. But what we do is we work pretty closely. We, we kind of warn the architect that that's going to happen. And, um, you know, when we're actually writing the proposal, um, we say, we're going to look at enclosure on this and um, we're going to want to look at, you know, maybe two or three different enclosure schemes. We're going to need your help um, probably with it to help us define all of the different layers of like the roof assembly, for example, or exactly what curtain wall system we're looking at. We're going to need your help in defining what those materials are so that we're making the right assumptions. Um, we we're a little lucky in the fact that we have an enclosure engineering group and they help us with, with performing those enclosure LCAs. Um, so that, that helps us out a little bit, but it's really nothing, bef we've been doing this for a while, even before we had enclosure engineering. And um, even then we just spoke with the architect and got the, their input on it. In comparison to the amount of structure that there is, the enclosure is, quite a bit smaller, even though there are a lot of components to their materials. So I don't think it's anything that the structural engineer can't tackle. Um, I think that you could take on that scope. We, we, have taken on, we have taken on that scope. I've actually not done it where 
somebody else was responsible for coming up with that piece of the pie and then we combined it. Um, okay, there's a question. Is there guidance as to what phases of the project the LCA should be conducted for reporting back to SE 2050? Uh, I should know the answer to this, but I, I don't. Um, we can get you that answer. Um, you know, I guess in general, the spirit of LCA is to be using it once a material is selected and then working within that, you know, structural system that's chosen to make reductions throughout the design process. I believe we are looking for LCA of the completed design structure, so not necessarily of the constructed structure, but of, of basically what you send in for permit and looking for the GWP of that. But again, I can confirm that and there will be guidance on the, um, the SE 2050 website once the database goes live next month on that. So let me confirm. But I would be curious, Kelly, for maybe for like lead, what's what's the requirement for that? Is it is it the permitted drawings? Is it the constructed building? What's the what's the guidance there for that? Yeah. Um if there's any. <laughs> there, there, there is, but um what's done is is um is interesting actually so um for lead it's a design or a construction credit meaning that you can submit it during design or construction and then you just basically need to validate that what your assumptions were were actually um done in construction um there is not a lot of documentation that's required for the construction phase which is um you know it's kind of something that we're talking about you know within the mr tag right now um, to make sure that, you know, people are following through on what they say they're going to do, um, following through on actually implementing the carbon savings that they say they're going to get, because that's a really important, the, probably the most important part of this, of this conversation is actually reducing embodied carbon, not just talking about it, not just analyzing it, not just showing that it theoretically could happen. Um, so that's an important point important part of it, but it is a design or a construction credit. Um, I would say that where you want to start an LCA is as early as possible. Um, you want to start an LCA really, you know, in schematic design. That's when you want to be weighing different alternatives. That's when you want to establish, okay, what, what would this building be if I didn't try to reduce my carbon? What, what would that building be? Okay, now if I take some carbon reduction measures, what can I make this building? And that needs to happen very early in the design process. So um, for us, when we are pitching doing an LCA, we pitch it as soon as possible. Um, and we basically say that we, we can't really do this after the fact. We can perform an LCA that doesn't get you any reduction after the fact, um, but uh, to make the reductions, you really need to do it as early in the design process um, as possible because what we're talking here talking about here are system changes or uh, material changes or material reductions. And yeah, as all of you know, that wants to happen very early in the design process. Um, okay, so more questions. And I'm gonna keep going because we have six more minutes. Yeah, I'm gonna try and type some to type some answers because uh, I don't think we'll get to all these. Okay. Um, ACI's position on using longer cure times for strength evaluation. It's perfectly fine. You can specify 56, 90 day strengths. Um, that was that is commonly done for high strength concrete, and it can be done really for any for any type of concrete. What you what you probably need to focus on with that is um, is is that available in your market? Do they have 56 and 90 day mixes in your market? Number one. Um, number two, you you probably need to have a conversation with your testing agent about when to break cylinders. I always have to have a conversation um, about when we're gonna break cylinders. So I'm not adding cost to the project with additional cylinders um, if you are looking at 56 and 90 day strengths. Um, so Alana asked, what is the vision for how concrete mixes are defined in the benchmark study? Is it by F prime C only? Or are you trying to include other mixed performance or application usage metrics. Can you answer that one, Megan? Um, hey, Alana, not sure what you mean by benchmark study. Uh, we did a 
study uh, within the SEI Sustainability Committee that did, was get uh, was used to help set the benchmarks for the first U.S. Low Carbon Concrete Code. Um, let me uh, let me read back your question, and I can try and answer it, or you can type more. Um, if only by FIM Sierra trying to include other mix. Um, Yeah, I think for, well, at least at our firm, we've definitely been trying to stick with performance-based um, specifications. I know that's not common everywhere. Uh, really at the um, request of concrete suppliers like yourself, or producers like yourself that say that that's the easiest way that they can achieve uh, what we're desiring for on projects. As a structural engineer, you know, we care about strength and shrinkage. We don't necessarily care about everything else. Um, and if, or if that's the most things that we care about, like if we're just specifying that in our performance based specs um, and letting you all come up with the mix uh, that can achieve that, uh, I think is the way that that we're going. But definitely please type uh, more if we didn't answer your question. Okay, we got a question. Um, is the NCSEA um, sustainability committee also looking at climate change adaptation related to design for inevitable and unavoidable impacts of climate change, along with the mitigation and embodied carbon efforts. Um, yes, so we're pretty new. Um, so I don't think that we've outlined everything that we want to do, but absolutely that's something that we should do. Um, and I encourage you to join our committee to help start that conversation. Um, there is also a resilience committee that's um, with NCSEA, and I could see some partnership happening with the resilience committee over topics like that. Um, somebody chimed in with tax incentives. There is a historic structures tax credit. Um, so that's just an FYI. Um, let me see this question. Have you done a project where a client requested a whole building LCA? And if so, how did you coordinate the structural systems and materials with the architectural systems and materials? Did the architect perform the LCA just on their materials? I think we answered this one actually. Uh, yeah, I answered this one earlier really. Okay. Um, yeah, so some clients want sustainable design but don't understand embodied carbon. Is there a resource for how architects can set embodied carbon goals and what kind of services they could get from engineers? Um, is there research for how architects can set embodied carbon goals? Well, I guess first I would say that in advance of embodied carbon goals, I would just say, just track it, just start with measuring it. Step one is just measure where you're at um, and then I mean, based on your different projects, you know, you may be able to achieve more on some than others. And, you know, it may be that achieving 10% reduction on a project that you know is going to be this certain system type and there's no way around it would be a great achievement. Um, so I would say that um, goals can vary from project to project, uh, depending on the constraints of that project. How do you determine an ad service fee for providing LCA? Um, well, I think it's like any other ad service fee where it's just how much time it's gonna take you, you think to do it. And then just being really specific about what you're gonna do and what you're not gonna do. Um, how many different alternatives are you gonna look at? Are you gonna look at five different building alternatives? Are you gonna look at two? Um, you can set the parameters of your LCA and it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Is it the lead credit? Um, is it that you're going to look at it for this building um, and just report it out? Are you going to do a carbon study? That's different than an LCA. Um, you know, an LCA is all life cycles and all these different environmental impacts. It actually doesn't have to be that. You could just look at embodied carbon. That's a little bit, that, that's, that's pretty, pretty easy. Um, and, and there's no reason to be scared of LCA. It's an accounting process. It's, it's not even as difficult as structural engineering. It's just... <laughs> adding yeah. up materials, multiplying them by an impact factor, and then making reductions. Megan, you want to add on to that? Um, no, I think you answered that as I would have. I think, um, like you were saying, uh, 
yeah, d defining your boundary, like how are you going to be updating us at every of the major project milestones like SD, DD, CDs, um, I think will help you set that that hour limit that you think that it's going to take you to perform that. But um, I think those, that's really good guidance, Kelly. And yeah, limiting the number of options that you're going to look at, for example, and how often you're going to update that, I think is just going to be key to help you set, set those fees. And yeah, I would just base it on hours you think it's going to take to estimate those quantities. And I do think, you know, with in your firm, that's great data for you guys to have. You know, I think uh, everyone would love to have that data more accurately. You can better, you know, get your material quantity estimates um, for projects that, you know, you guys all put in your, you know, schematic reports and all of that. So I think it's just great data to have um, and know from your firm, like how, how much, what are your quantities um, and then what are the impacts and how can you reduce those? Yeah, great point. Maybe that's um, where we should be end, Kelly. Or is there one or one more quick I'm one? I'm gonna read this out. Um, so okay. this is from this is from Jennifer. Um, following up on previous question, SEI codes and standards executive committee is exploring the impact of climate change on the environmental hazards relevant to ASCE seven: wind, snow, rain, flood, and ice. The goal is to begin the work to consider how to address this in our standards. Um, so I think that was good information to have um, related to the previous to the previous question we got. Um, so I think that we can we can end it there. Um, you know, thank you all for joining. Thank you for the wonderful questions. Um, I hope that, you know, this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, if we are, haven't already started a conversation with you, but I hope this is the beginning of a conversation and, and many of you um, get involved um, in, at least in your firms and in your own projects. And then hopefully in NCSEA, um, and also in SC 2050. Great, thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Megan. And on behalf of NCSEA, I would like to thank you all for your participation in today's event. This concludes the program. Thank you and have a great day. <laughs>